expect to be able to hear clearly. Um, but I, I think it's a very interesting shape. Um, and it's interesting, it goes down there, has this little funny little line down to the Swallowhead Springs. That point there is the Swallowhead Springs. So there's some interesting things in there. Now, one of the things I need to do is I need to move this forward with some more detailed topographic data and some more detailed acoustic parameters. I mean, I really put in dummy parameters when I did this. So I need to see, you know, what does it look like with a voice? What does it look like with a drum? What does it look like with a horn? To try and see the distinctions between these things. But there's something that's definitely worth looking at there. So that gave us enough to work on for our experiment, which involved putting people up there. This is Simon O'Dwyer of Sounds Ancient from um, uh, the Republic of Ireland, who's been working with Peter Holmes on uh, ancient in instruments for some time. And I believe, Peter, you came on, on that weekend, didn't you? Yeah. And it was good fun. Um, we had, uh, because then we had people up on the top of the hill, and we had members of the public as audience in the landscape. And one of the things I wanted to really make a bit of a plea for here today is actually using members of the public in experimental work. If we're looking at audiences, then let's use the people who would love to be an audience um, and, and get their experience back, um, because they they're, they're as equal, we're all experts in being an audience. We're not all be experts in being performers, but certainly in being audience, most of us have our expertise. In addition to um, Simon and Maria with ancient instruments, we also used the human voice because we were keen, we thought that the human voice is a very particular thing in terms of communication. Simon and Maria weren't willing to, to, to use the human voice because they were concerned about authenticity. They were concerned about what kinds of sounds they might make um, and whether or not they would be the kinds of things we could be sure could have been made in the past. Again, I think it's easy to get stuck on the sounds produced thing, and I, I respect that. So we had somebody else in to do some of the, the human voice work. Um, and then we had these members of the public for the audience and had them in small groups, and they gave us back responses. And I'll just tighten this up really small, which is just to say we found that that model that I showed was incredibly conservative. People could hear and in hear intelligibly from much further away. If we, um, if I can go back. Uh, no, I won't try to go back because it'll just ruin that. But I, 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 another time I'll do it, I'll get my, my map out so I can show where people could hear from. But they could hear from, um, from good distance away at a lot of the major monuments of the area. The interesting one of the places that nobody could ever hear anything was inside Avebury Henge. So um, the, the, there may be some sound insulation in, in, that mo in, in the structure of Avebury. That's actually because we could hear um, uh, particularly some of the louder horns could be heard as far away as Windmill Hill, um, which is on the other side of a a Avebury Henge, but not from within the Henge. So um, there's some interesting patterns there. So I think when I do the modeling, it'll be interesting to see if I, if I refine the model, whether we get these um, uh, more generous soundscapes showing, or whether that actually the ability to hear um, in experience is different from what you might expect from a noise map. Um, just want to bring up some conceptual things, some potential distinctions. These are words that get used a lot of the time, particularly these last two, get used interchangeably in a lot of archaeological literature, audience and spectators. And to me, they're very different. It's a very different thing to look at something and not expect to be able to hear it, or to be an audience. You know? And the, the actually, a crowd of spectators is often much larger than, a, than an audience. They don't behave the same way. It's not the same social relation to be an audience as to be a spectator. And then again, we can look at a smaller and tighter social relation again, which might be in a congregation, where you're actually, at your, you are listening, but you are at the same time some, more part of what you're listening to. And then you can be a participant or a celebrant or an actor. These different kinds of relationships relate to what you can hear. And so different kinds of architectural structures in the past may give us clues to whether you have a congregation, an audience, or a group of spectators at any one event. And, and those things have social importances. Um, just to sort of move forward with what I, I need to do yet with this work before I can close it off and publish it, the main body of the work produced an awful lot more information about the development of the monument. Um, it was an excavation that uh, re-excavated Atkinson's um, 1960s excavations and refined a lot of it. And we have a much more complex understanding of the development of that monument. And although the site is still going to always be called Silbury Hill, for us, the hill is actually the last bit. And for a, lar for a large part of the, the history of that monument, it was very much more a ditch with some stuff going on in the middle. And the ditch is actually the most persistent part of the whole development of the monument. So what I really need to do 
now is go back and say, okay, when the monument looked like this, what were the acoustic properties of it? When it looked um, in the other stages, what were the acoustic properties of it? And is the final form, does the final form enhance the acoustic properties of the site, or were those acoustic properties always there in the natural landscape? And uh, so that's the next piece of work that I need to do, and it, I, I'm, I'm waiting until we've got 3D models of these earlier phases in order to be able to do it. Just want to bring up, this is a, the, one of the diggers involved in the, in the repair um, of the site, and it brings up the concept of work. And one of the things that uh, is really clear from our excavations is that nice little flat top, which you all saw in the original picture where we had our performers, um, appears to be at the earliest a late Iron Age surface and probably, um, probably a Roman or post-Roman surface. Um, so you know, you, you're not looking at the original form of the hill. And we're, we're trending back to the idea that the original form of the hill was a domed form. It's less likely that you had a platform for performance. And our understanding of the kinds of rituals as such that are involved in the construction, uh, involved in this monument, may be as much about the building of it as it is about the final form of it. And so I want to sort of bring back to the notion of, of, of building and, the, and, and the, the, the social and ritual importance of building, but also the sound of building. Um, and I've can, been thinking a bit about things like work songs, but also even just the sounds that are involved in, in, in working and building and making and what those things, how those things work in this landscape is worth considering as well. Um, just to, one last thing, if you bring that to that shape, of the, uh, of the soundscape there. This is a geophysical plot um, uh, that was done at the same time as the excavation of the areas around it. And this here, many of you will recognize pretty quickly, is, uh, is a Roman small town um, uh, based you know, with, the, with the Swallowhead Springs as potentially a, 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 a significant feature, but there are also some, some wells that we've seen in it as well. And we haven't done, this is geophysics, and we haven't done ground truthing of this with excavation yet. But the interesting thing to point out is that the Roman town is sited exactly in the spot with the best hearing from the top of the hill. Um, so when we think about prehistoric sites, we have to keep remembering that they did continue existing after prehistory. That's how come we can go and see them. And that other periods will have made use of their acoustic properties as well as any of the original uh, builders' intentions. So that's my thoughts. something that we did struggle with and that certainly Simon and Maria worked really hard to choose a range of instruments that could have been in use. But of course, there's so little in, 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 in uh, England and they were using Irish recon well, reconstructions. Well, and examples from Sussex, from southern England, mm. of that same instrument. So it mm -hmm. was OK. It's OK to, to, to go with it. Okay. Yeah, it was yeah. a little bit later, but it was OK. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. There, there, again, and they also made use of lithophones and a variety of other things yes. as well while they were there. I didn't, didn't want to take the time to go into all of the things that they used, particularly since that's really more their research than, you know, and, and I don't want to kind of sort of be presenting for them. So, um, um, yeah, so it was, a, and, and you're right, it's an interesting difficulty there, you know. The weather was nice. The present time being the original surface, has that become accepted? I know, I know it was talked about. <coughs> Well, you know, it, it, it's now we've got, we, uh, in addition to, I didn't go into the excavation project, um, but the, the excavation project focused on two areas. 